<laughs> Rare sea cucumbers. Welcome back, everybody. Um, let's get into it. And uh, before I get right back into the material, um, I want to show you how to draw an owl. Uh, so surely somebody knows this, but I'll pause and let you read it. Yeah, okay, they're all nodding like, yes, we've heard this joke before, Richard, move on. Now, okay, why is this here? I assumed you'd all seen this, but I wanna, I wanna show it to you because this course is like that, like this, right? Uh, <laughs> it's, and I'm sympathetic to that. So what I'm showing you how to do in the lectures is to draw some circles, <laughs> right? Uh, that's what I'm doing. And then I send you off to your homework and I'll draw the rest of the owl. And <laughs> you're supposed to submit some owls or something, right? I know it's like that. And, it, it just kind of has to be that way. There are things that are hard, and you can show people the outline of the steps, but there's a lot of things you just have to practice yourself to get it right. And we're entering a part of the course in particular where I've, I've drawn a lot of circles for you, <laughs> um, the geocentric circles, if you will. And you can go quite far with those things, and now we're getting into you know the, the finer techniques of drawing feathers <laughs> and such. And it is necessary that I skip over a lot of that detail in lecture, but the notes have a lot more detail. The book has a lot more detail than I can possibly give you in the lecture now uh, because of all the little moving bits of these things. So there's a lot of code that makes things happen, the things that I'll show you in the lecture, and that code is in the book. It is. It's there. I, I had to write the code to draw the figures, and it's there in the book. But I won't show it to you. And so if you're feeling like, oh my god, how does that work? That's okay, you gotta go read the book, right? And then you can draw the rest of the owl. <laughs> yeah, it's just how it is. So if you're not, as I keep saying, if you're feeling confused, that's, that's only because you're paying attention. And uh, you don't have to get, you don't have to understand everything at once. Um, and your owl doesn't have to be perfect either. I mean, think about this metaphor. I love this, I love this joke, I do. I use it constantly, but because um, this is life, right? It's like this, it's science. <laughs> but, uh, uh, what it doesn't get quite right about the scientific endeavor is that um, we don't have a particular target. It doesn't have to look like an owl, right? We don't know what the owl is. Uh, so there's actually a different exploration metaphor here. You're drawing some circles and it's fine. There's an exploration that goes on. Um, the right, there are many, many right models for an analysis is the point I want to make. Uh, there are many, many owls that would be satisfactory. Uh, there's not some perfect platonic owl that you must draw. There's not some perfect platonic Bayesian model that we're aiming for. We're trying to extract evidence. Um, okay, so let me remind you, when we ended last week, I'm giving you uh, an introductory example to doing a Poisson regression. To remind you, a Poisson distribution is a count distribution. What's a count? Number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to infinity, right? And the Poisson distribution arises when there's some unknown maximum count we're never going to see it, uh, and uh, but the rate of any one item, one trial, is very, very low. Uh, and then we just need one parameter to describe the distribution, the expected count. And this is a very handy uh, way to model counts. Um, and uh, I had built up the first Poisson regression for you, and we had just gotten to the point where we're going to do posterior predictions, and that's what I'm showing you on the slide. I'm plotting the model predictions against the raw data. This is a very small data set. I like teaching data sets like this, um, uh, but also uh, anthropology is often like this, right? Uh, we're not going to get more data. This is it, <laughs> right? Uh, so this is all the oceanic societies we've got good data, good data sets on. So we, we, we go to war with the data we have. And um, I'm showing you the same posterior predictions on two different scales. On the left, you've got the way the model sees it. So the predictions are done on we're interested in how log population is associated with total tools because there's an underlying theory which says that uh, you get more total tools as a, in proportion to the magnitude of the population size. Yeah, you get more innovation is the idea uh, with larger populations, and so you get more complex cultures, more complicated toolkits. And there are two trend lines here because one is <coughs> high contact islands and one is low contact islands. So the uh, in particular, the dashed line is the trend for islands that have low contact with their neighbors, and the solid line is for high contact with neighbors. Remember, that was the other interacting effect we wanted in the model. The idea is if you're, if you're a small society, but you're next to a big society like Tonga, then it doesn't hurt you so much that you're small, because you get to steal all of Tonga's tools. Yeah, and Tonga was big 
one of the biggest. So, um, yeah, you can see Tonga there, right? <laughs> so, uh, only thing bigger is Hawaii. And so you'll see that uh, there's definitely, for both, there's a very strong relationship with log population. Uh, and oh, I always say the open circles are the low contact islands in the data set, right? Hawaii had low contact. You can imagine why, if you know your Pacific geography. Right, Hawaii is way out there. It's a miracle anyone found it. <laughs> yeah, it's the middle of nowhere. There's nothing near Hawaii. It's nothing. And all the other Polynesian islands are, are near one another for the most part. And uh, easy, to, easy to get from one to the other. So uh, Hawaii also has the biggest population historically. So there's a strong relationship with log population and there's some difference with the contact rates. Uh, low contact islands um, do have uh, lower expected total tools. Um, at any particular size until you get out to this weird effect at the very high end. There's massive uncertainty. You see the compatibility intervals. There's massive uncertainty out there for the <coughs> high contact islands because there are no high contact islands with large population sizes in this data set. So you see that compatibility interval just explodes. Um, we're looking at the, the upper right of the left hand figure, right? And it just has no idea where it's going uh, up there. But the model lets the black line cross back over, so the model is essentially saying, yeah, it's possible, given all the assumptions you've made, that at very, very large population sizes, um, high contact islands actually have fewer tools than low contact islands. I want to assert that this is weird. <laughs> this is a very weird feature of this model, and it seems wrong. Right? It seems like the model should be constrained somehow not to produce that prediction. Um, but it does. Uh, now I'm showing you the same predictions exactly on the right, but on the natural scale, if you will, where the act the horizontal axis is population by head count, just counting people. And um, uh, same vertical axis, same curves, but now they're squished and transformed. Uh, and you can see it's the same things. You see that switch. You see the massive uncertainty in the compatibility intervals uh, on the high end. Uh, and Hawaii is still out there. Uh, last thing I want to say about this is it, when you look in the text, um, so at the bottom of this slide I say point size proportional to this thing called the Pareto K diagnostic value. Okay, what is this? This is where you draw the owl, right? So uh, I, all the code is in the text to do this. This comes from the Pareto smooth leave one out cross validation uh, metric. So if you if you uh, calculate the expected out of uh, sample predictive accuracy of this model using the Pareto smooth leave one out cross validation metric, it gives you for each point in the data set this Pareto K diagnostic value, which is like a measure of leverage. It's a measure of how much force each point is exerting on the posterior fit. And this is a really handy thing to look at because you get an idea about which points are making it sensitive in prediction. And so what it's saying here is, uh, so I've scaled them and the big points are the ones that are exerting high leverage and you can see Hawaii is the biggest. Uh, and you can probably look at this picture and see why Hawaii has high leverage because it's the only population, it has an order of magnitude larger population than all of the other. Um, historical oceanic societies. And so it's it's the only thing that's informing what happens on the really high end. There's not much else to do about this because again, we can't like invent another island society, <laughs> but uh, now you know. And so what you might be motivated to do, you might, well, uh, I don't think you want to drop Hawaii from the analysis, but you might drop Hawaii from the analysis playfully to see what happens. And if you do that, well, maybe I'll give that to you as a homework problem at some point. Uh, but. Uh, you can probably see that there's a trend in the lower ones, despite Hawaii. It's just Hawaii is doing a lot of work on exactly positioning the high end. Um, okay, questions about this? Just draw the owl, right? Just no. Uh, there's a lot of text. There's a lot of uh, uh, code in the book, uh, uh, in particular for drawing both of these figures. You can get an idea what's going on. Um, before we leave this example, though. Uh, let me, let me try to summarize a couple of the criticisms I have of this model. And these are criticisms that extend in general to generalized linear models. And uh, now I like generalized linear models. They're unreasonably effective, like all geocentric models. They're unreasonably effective in, in a wide range of circumstances. Um, you give me some random variables and tell me nothing about them, I can figure out a GLM and I can describe associations. Yay, major paper, right? Uh, you can do a lot of work with generalized linear models. but they generate a bunch of anomalies. If you know things about, about the variables that are external to the, to the data set you're given, 
often generalized linear models produce ridiculous effects. And I think there are a few things in this case that are like that. And there are <coughs> symptoms of a, something I like to call generalized linear madness, uh, which is if the first time you have drawn up a quantitative model is when you start doing the statistics, chances are something ridiculous is going to happen. Because right? there's scientific knowledge that is missing. And this is what I call generalized linear madness. So uh, this model is terrible even though it's geocentric, right? It's, it's, uh, it's describing the relationship, sure, but it's got some things in it that don't make sense. So the first thing, the most egregious, I think, is that the intercepts don't pass through the origin. So what do I mean? When these lines come down, they cross zero population anywhere they like. Uh, this is impossible, <laughs> given the nature of the data set. It's got to be true that for any real relationship between total tools and total people, the zero and the zero have to go together. You got zero people, you got zero tools, I assert, based upon the physics of how monkeys work. <laughs> zero monkeys on an island, zero tools, right? Uh, if you add one person, you might get a tool, <laughs> right? And then it goes up from there monotonically. It's got to work that way. That's the way the theory has got to work. And this generalized linear model does not assert that because it just has a free intercept in it. And the intercept could go anywhere. Right, the data just tell it where to go. It doesn't have the physics anchoring it to the point where it has to cross, which is the origin of zero and zero. Does that make sense? Um, so now this isn't a total disaster. If you were, if you, we are learning that there's a general relationship between population size and total tools here, uh, but it, it does it itches my brain immensely uh, that this is going on. It's also this weird thing where they cross at the top. Uh, that bothers me a lot too. It seems like the it's, it's capable of doing things that really don't make sense. What if we stopped for a second and um, thought scientifically instead of statistically, or say purely statistically? So let me, let me run a, a, the simplest model I could think of of this system by you. And um, so what we want, if we're going to have a scientific <laughs> model of data like this, is we want a dynamical systems model. We want a model that says from one time point to the next, individuals are inventing tools and they accumulate in the population. There are also processes that lose tools. At some point these processes balance and then we get an expected number of tools, uh, a technological sophistication of a society. That's a basic cultural evolution model. So what's the simplest uh, we could do? Uh, we start, we have delta t, which is the change in the number of tools in some generation, time step, and there are innovation <laughs> inputs. So uh, P is population size, and this is per person, and then there's a rate of innovation alpha, that is per person. How many tools can they make? Right, invent. This is inventions, right? This is new tools you come up with, right? You gotta slice an avocado. It's really frustrating to do it with a knife and a, and a spoon, right? Have you ever done this? Yeah. And, <laughs> um, and so you invent some new fancy, like, you know, hoop or something. You can just slice through the avocado and it takes the seed out, and, you know. These things exist, they're terrible, just use a spoon. But, <laughs> um, but people invent these things, so that's very clever, that's your alpha, your contribution to posterity is you've invented the avocado slicer. Yeah, and uh, so the alpha P part is just kind of the basic assumption, the verbal model itself is that each person has some chance of inventing something. And so as you get more people, you get more tools, you get more innovation. This is how economies work, right? If you add more inventors, you get more inventions. Yeah, and there's a proportionality thing there we have to estimate. And then what's the beta for? The beta is this thing, if you're an economist, uh, you'd call this an elasticity. Uh, this governs the diminishing returns on uh, how numbers of people uh, create innovations. So think of it this way, uh, there's saturation effects. Uh, you can just get lazy because someone else will invent the avocado slicer for you. Yeah, so uh, beta controls the diminishing. Each additional person contributes less innovations than the previous one fewer innovations, sorry, <laughs> than the previous one uh, because there's some diminishing return effect uh, to innovativeness. If you're the only person on the island, then you got to invent everything yourself and you're really motivated, right? And then you add some more inventors and then you start getting lazy. Yeah, it's like a lab in that regard. So uh, we need to measure alpha and beta. They're parameters, but P is data. And then there's the loss. Um, people forget stuff and tools are lost, either, well, either because uh, people forget them and the technique is lost and you can't reinvent it, or um, you don't need to use it anymore. The reason you invented that tool in the first place uh, is no longer worthwhile because there's just some rate which ecological challenges come and go where you live. 
Um, so this is the world's simplest cultural evolution model, uh, but I wanted to show it. I know most of you don't work on cultural evolution, although I also know some of you do. I wanted to show it because now we're going to fit this to data. And I wanted to show you at least one model in this course, <laughs> which is not a generalized linear model. Um, and uh, okay, so we've got three parameters now, alpha, beta, and gamma, just some loss rate per tool loss rate. Notice that the loss term is per tool, it's not per person. The more tools you have, the more you're going to lose. Yeah, the more, you, the more you know, the more you forget every day. Let me tell you, that's true, right? <laughs> Forgotten more in the last decade than I learned in the previous 20, <laughs> right? Uh, so, got to make room for new bureaucracy rules and stuff like that, right? <laughs> a lot of gazettes to memorize. <laughs> uh, so, uh, scientific model. Uh, our goal here now is we, if we're going to match this to data, we've got a cross section. We don't have a time series. This model implies a time series. And if we had a time series, that'd be gold. We could do that. And uh, where I learned, uh, I learned statistics in any studying ecology sorts of problems where you have time series of like numbers of wolves and Yellowstone and stuff like that. But um, we can also use the same model in a cross sectional case. We need an expectation. So you can solve these dynamic systems for steady states. That is, after a while, the innovation and loss processes balance. And where will they balance? Well, they balance where the change is zero. When delta t equals zero, that means the two processes are balanced. That's it. So you replace delta t with zero and you solve for t. Boom. Science. Right? <laughs> so on the left, we've got, I put a hat over the t. Those of you taking modeling with me, you know about the hats, right? It's like a party. Everybody gets a hat. All of the t's, that means it's the steady state um, that you go to. And then uh, it's this alpha p, to the, alpha p to the beta over gamma is the expected number of tools. This will still be stochastic, right? It's not actually a fixed point. Uh, but this is like the mean of the stationary distribution that you'll get. And uh, then we can just stick it inside the Poisson. Uh, there's no link function. There's no ad hocery. It's just there. Now, surely this is an inadequate model in many ways. But I would assert it's a way better start than generalized linear madness where we had, because the intercept is fixed here guarantee you this passes through the origin. And we didn't have to force it to do that or anything. All right, it's, it's still going to do silly things a little bit, but th at least now the violations mean something and they're going to push you in the direction of some actual, you know, science. Hail science. Right? So, um, you can just write this into a Markov chain, no problem. Just like all this other stuff you've learned. Right? So just draw some circles. <laughs> right? And, uh, uh, same idea, this is just like the Poisson regression that we did at the end of Friday, but now for lambda, there's no link function because we've just got this expected lambda now, expected number of tools. The only trick is all, the, all these parameters have to be positive. And you've got an array of tools at your disposal to ensure that parameters have po are positive. I'm using two here because I wanted to show you two different ways to do it. Um, one is you can exponentiate the parameter. So that's what I've done with alpha. If you exponentiate any real number, it's positive. All right, so this is log normal. Think about a log normal variable. If a normal distribution can be any real number, negative or positive, if you exponentiate it, it's guaranteed to be positive. That's why log normal variables are always positive. So this is what, if you exponentiate, this is just a trick for making alpha positive. Yeah. Uh, then you have to be careful to understand what the, uh, you're talking about a log normal now is what this d norm is. It's a log normal with mean one and uh, standard deviation one. And for the other two, I just um, give them exponential distributions and exponential random variables are positive. Yeah, does that make sense? So the only thing you have to do is you know what the parameters mean now, they're rates and so they're positive. Uh, that's what we need. And then it runs, uh, chains happen and um, now we can compare the two models. And on the left is what I'm calling the scientific model and on the natural population scale in the horizontal and then just to repeat it so you can compare the, sci the statistical model on the right. Now I'm not going to argue that the scientific model is, is, doesn't have flaws here but at least it passes through the origins now. You see that? It's aiming for zero, zero as it's got to and you get real separation now between the, the solid line and the dashed line. It doesn't let them cross uh, at high values. And you get all this stuff for free because there's actually some science that went into making this model. So it's not just pure generalized linear madness. Certainly there are violations, but the violations mean something scientifically now. They're not just weird features of the tide prediction engine, right? Staring at the weird gears at the bottom. And the parameters have biological meaning. You could actually use alternative data sets, experimental data sets. 
uh, to get information about those parameters in addition to this kind of cross-sectional data, right? Unlike, say, alpha in the Poisson regression, which means nothing. It's just a thing that bends the line around, yeah? Sorry, this is my sermon. So those of you who live in my department, you know these things. I'm really, like, animated about uh, uh, trying to have real theory models made it to the, the statistics. Um, the thing about, you can't really teach a class like that because um, every particular scientific example, you, there's all these details that are peculiar to it. And that's the problem. So why do I teach a class of generalized linear models? Because that's useful to everybody, right? It's just got this flaw that you need to be aware of is you want to see it as the generalized linear model is some entree to a research tradition you will build <laughs> where you will have more meaningful scientifically based models um, that can make predictions at a bunch of different scales. Okay. Uh, Last thing I want to mention about Poisson regressions, it's super important and useful, is that if the different counts you've got in the data set, each row, uh, there may be different observation windows, so-called exposures, that apply to each. So if, for example, um, uh, now it doesn't work for the oceanic islands, but say you're counting fish. Uh, someone goes fishing in a lake and they're pulling out fish and the fish come out in a Poisson rate. Okay, that's approximately correct because there are a lot of fish in there and you won't catch most of them today. Yeah, so it's approximately a Poisson, right? And, but if somebody spends twice as much time fishing as you did, you can't just directly compare those counts. You've got to adjust for the so-called exposure difference. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so how do you do that? Well, there is a very principled way to do this in a Poisson regression. You just use what's called an offset, uh, which is the log of the amount of time spent fishing. And you just add it to the linear model. And so uh, this is a point where I say just draw the rest of the owl, because I'm going to skip over the rest of this slide, to say that in the book there's a section where I slowly derive this for you and why it's exactly the right thing to do. There's no ad hocery here. It's not magic that it's the log of the number of hours. It's required. Uh, it's the only reasonable thing to do if you believe the Poisson rate assumption. Okay, so draw the rest of the owl at home. Um, there are a number of other uh, count distributions, and I say more about these in the text. Uh, multinomial categorical models are extrapolations of the binomial and logistic regressions to more than two unordered outcomes. So it's like a, a coin with more than two sides. And you flip it and it's going to land on one of them, right? Or one of those, those fancy Dungeons and Dragons dice. Right, like 20 sides, you can do that as a, as a multinomial or something. And uh, uh, geometric distributions are count distributions, but they're the number of time steps until some event. Uh, uh, and then there are mixture distributions, and there are examples in uh, at the start of chapter 12 in the book, uh, these things called beta binomial and the gamma Poisson, also called a negative binomial. These are binomial and Poisson regressions, but they allow the rates to vary by some unobserved heterogeneity uh, in each case. And so they, they have wider variance. They're a lot like multi-level models, but they're like multi-level models in which you don't estimate the random effects. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to teach these in class, but you may want to look at the, the notes. And then I am going to spend uh, two weeks doing multi-level models. And you'll see that those behave similarly to these. Uh, but are actually much more flexible. So I'd rather spend the class time on the multi-level models. Uh, but I think these are very useful types of models. Um, at the bottom, I mentioned this thing, this uh, Dirichlet multinomial thing. Um, we'll talk about Dirichlet distributions, I think, on Friday. Uh, I hope to get to them and, and tell you what that is. OK. I promised some cats. Uh, so um, I want to motivate a very useful class of models for you called survival analysis. And I say just motivate because uh, this is the kind of thing you've got to go home and, and run the code and, and look at the details. Um, draw the owl, right? I mean, draw some circles, and then you've got to go home and draw the owl. Uh, but uh, let me motivate. There are two things to really understand about survival analysis. First of all, it's they're like count models because they're discrete events that are happening. The thing of interest is that stuff is happening. Um, and we're going to count it. And those events could be mortality events. They could be births. Uh, the, the example in the text is cat adoptions, right? How many cats are being adopted in Austin, Texas? This is the actual data set. And, uh, uh, but uh, to do this properly, to count those events, what you need to do is estimate the rate of those events. This is just like the Poisson and binomial models. The parameters are about rates. 
and the outcome is a count. Survival models have that feature to them as well, uh, but because the exposure window changes and other kind of events create this uh, effect called censoring, you don't get to see some cases whether the event would have happened or not. So imagine some lonely cat in the Austin Animal Care Facility and um, it's waiting to be adopted and then it escapes, <laughs> right? Because the door is open. This happens in the data set, by the way. There are escape, there's an escape code. <laughs> there are escapees. <laughs> they're loose and they're free, <laughs> right? And uh, uh, we don't know if that cat ever would have been adopted or not. All right, now it's free. So what do you do with that data? And the wrong thing to do is throw it away. <laughs> Because how long it waited not being adopted is information about the rate. So you've got to count the stuff that wasn't counted. It's really weird. This is a weird thing about survival analyses. Uh, so the thing that you want to model, get the probability of, is the waiting time. And it's not just the waiting time until adoption. It's also the waiting time uh, that you weren't adopted until something else happened that meant you weren't adopted or we didn't get to see. And those things could be escaped, died of natural causes, Right, all number of kinds of things that can happen to cats. They ascend, <laughs> right? Uh, whatever happens to the cat. Um, and this is a phenomenon called censoring. And there's uh, two kinds of censoring to worry about, left censoring and right censoring. Left censoring is when we don't know when the risk period started. We don't know when the cat was brought into the animal care facility and could have been adopted. That's called left censoring. And then there's right censoring, which is more common typically in data sets, that is, uh, the data set gets taken at some point and there are still cats in the facility that haven't been adopted yet, we need to use their data, even though they're right censored because the total time until their adoptions, we don't know it yet. These are the two kinds uh, of censoring to worry about. And you can handle them in the same sort of way. Uh, if you ignore censored cases, you get biased estimates. And, and for this audience, I tried to come up with an example you might understand. Imagine you want to estimate time to PhD in, say, a Max Planck graduate school program, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but you ignore all the people who drop out of the program, which never happens here, right? And, <laughs> but uh, you will get a biased estimate. Uh, the amount of time they spent in the program before they dropped out is information about how long it takes. And if you drop that out, you're going to be getting the wrong estimate. You're going to bias it in a particular direction. And I would like you to think about which direction the bias will go. Um, okay. Cats. So this is uh, in the rethinking package now. The, this is um, 20,000 cats from the Austin Animal Care Facility. This is all up on their website. This is how I get these things, right? <laughs> and uh, they've got it all. Um, and there's lots of things known about these cats. They've got a whole computerized system where cats come in, cats go out. They track them, right? And they've all got chips in them, right? So they get their IDs and you scan the cat. Computer pops up, tells you if the cat's been there before. Yeah. And uh, 20,000 cats, time to event, event is adoption. We're interested in adoption rates. Uh, in particular, we want to compare black cats to non-black cats. Because I have a hypothesis that people are bigoted against black cats. And I love black cats. I like all cats, actually. <laughs> but in particular, black cats. And uh, so uh, we're going to be estimate rates of adoption for black and non-black cats. And, but the thing is, there are adoption events. And then you just need to predict uh, given some assumption about the rate, uh, what was the probability you would wait exactly three weeks, say, to be adopted? Uh, but then there are uh, other events that censor your ability to see an adoption, and then we want to predict the probability of waiting that long and not being adopted. Does that make sense? This is the censoring, how you deal with censoring. And so what are the other events? Well, you, uh, you can load up the data and see there's lots of stuff that the something else is. Uh, some of them die. Uh, because some of these cats are brought in, they're very old, and uh, so it happens. Um, but they've got eight more lives, don't worry. Uh, and some of them escape. This is a code, <laughs> right? The cat just went missing, it escaped. And, uh, uh, and then pure censoring is the cat is still there when I downloaded the data. And so that's a case where the observation window has stopped, but the cat's life goes on, uh, but we need to use that data. Does this make sense? So epidemiological studies are often like this. You're trying to, to figure out um, uh, many causes of death and you're following a population along and things are happening to them, uh, lots of things. But it's not just that. Uh, basically, any kind of time series, you can think about censoring happening in it. Um, I have a paper uh, in press now which is about sage grouse, and we use a survival analysis in sage grouse uh, because you only do a focal follow in any particular grouse for an open window and then 
we want we're estimating probabilities of them doing particular cool things and you stop watching them when the beep happens and then they could still do it right even though you stopped watching them and uh, sage grouse are if you don't know sage grouse is the coolest living dinosaur just really a remarkable uh, north american dinosaur um, you should google them okay uh, so again, this is the part where I say go home and draw the owl. I just want to uh, give you an idea. The simplest kind of distribution, data, dis data probability distribution for uh, a survival analysis is an exponential. This means the rate is constant. And then it's like nuclear decay. Um, imagine a cohort of 100 cats. If there's a constant chance every day they get adopted, then there's a half-life. After a certain amount of time, half the cats will have been adopted. And then after that same amount of time, another half. So you go to a half, to a quarter to an eighth, to a sixteenth, to a thirty-second, and so on, right, until you're at a fraction of a cat, yeah, <laughs> as it goes, that goes down. And that's the constant rate. And so uh, for observed adoptions, we just get the probability of being adopted on that day comes from the exponential distribution. Easy enough. And then we've got a lambda, and we can put everything we know about the cat in the generalized linear model and, you know, with a log length, and, and we're gold. It's no problem. With censored cats, you got to think about what it means uh, to calculate the probability uh, that it hasn't happened after a certain amount of time. I mean, this is uh, I, there's this is the kind of thing you're going to have to sit down with and look at the notes uh, to think about it. This is drawing the owl, but you can use the exponential distribution, and you just need the cumulative version of it, right? Because it's the, it's the number of cats who will have been adopted up to that day, and then if you take the complement of that, you've got the number that who won't have been adopted up to that day. And that gives you your probability. So again, this won't be totally uh, clear right now in lecture. When you sit down with this and think it through with the notes in hand, you can figure it out. And this is where we get our censoring probability. The probability that the cat was not yet adopted on day D. And that's what you want to get. And it comes from this thing called the complementary cumulative distribution. Um, and what, whatever distribution you use for the rates, you always get the right censored probabilities from this so-called CCDF, the complementary cumulative distribution function. Okay, the code's in the text. The only exciting thing to say about this is this is the first model. I'm going to show you where you've got this uh, multiple choice uh, likelihood function in here. Uh, uh, Ulam is, is not feature complete yet, but it is a fully operational battle station, and you can destroy planets with it. <laughs> uh, and, and you, you're really just coding the log posterior here. Uh, this is just raw stuff. So um, you can just write, uh, what is this, days to event pipe adopted equals one. That is, if adopted equals one, this is the probability to use, and then it's just an exponential. Uh, if, a, uh, if adopted equals zero means it was something at some other kind of event. Now we're censored, and now we need this CCDF. And there's this custom tag, uh, and when Ulam sees a custom tag, it just dumps whatever you put in there into stand. So this is stand code in there. So this is why I say this battle station is fully operational. Uh, you can do lots of dangerous things. <laughs> uh, you can also do lots of really wonderful things uh, this way. Um, there's an overthinking box in the notes where I walk through this very slowly with you so you understand what's going on. Okay, what do we get? Some results. Uh, my hypothesis is correct. <laughs> um, black cats are discriminated against and they're adopted at lower rates than non-black cats. Uh, by the way, there's a column for cat color, which is why I can do this. And somebody was just making up cat colors there in Austin. <laughs> there are a lot of unique cat colors. They got really, really exciting. Um, so I just took the ones that are, were called black <laughs> and put them there. But there's also like black smoky and smoky black, <laughs> you know. And so there's lots of other things you might, you might code the data a different way. There might be more in here. Um, and the difference might be bigger. So there's a difference in rate, uh, and, and uh, please run this for yourself and take a look at how it works and draw the plot. Okay, let me spend um, the second half of this lecture transitioning to chapter 12. That was all chapter 11. Chapter 11 is intro to count models and survival analysis, give you an idea about how to work with link functions. Uh, chapter 12, we get into more elaborate types of generalized linear models where you start mixing components together to do, well, to handle very important data modeling problems. And the central metaphor I have for this is this is like monsters, because this thing about uh, monsters in mythology is it's not just that they're bigger, right? You don't get monsters that are just like a giant house cat or something like that. It's, it's always like bits of different animals stuck together for some reason. There's something about human cognition, cross-culturally, which loves this idea. 
It's like you make it monstrous, you've got to make it like bits of a dog and a cat. Now it's a monster. If it's just a big dog. That's not really that monstrous. You may give it multiple heads, okay, it's a monster. But uh, you've got to do something extra to it than just make it big. And uh, so, you know, whether it's minotaurs or is that a griffin? Um, and uh, on the lower left, I forget the name of this, but this is this uh, Australian Aboriginal uh, serpent thing. Um, and then uh, in Hawaiian legend, one of my favorites is this uh, a man who's the uh, offspring of a shark and a human, and he turns into a shark at night, and he's got like a big shark mouth in his back, and it's good, good times. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and uh, if you're going to think about statistical models, though, and making a monster, well, they're devices, right? They're like robots. It's kind of like the Junkyard Challenge. Has anybody ever watched this show? No, you, it's... It's, it's monstrous. <laughs> um, but it's people going to junkyards and trying to put together working devices that may kill them uh, during any particular episode. <laughs> and, uh, but then you have to go to a junkyard and then make a rocket-propelled go-kart. So that's the junkyard challenge. <laughs> um, so don't try this at home or anywhere near me. Uh, but uh, the stuff we're going to do is in some sense like a junkyard challenge, but we've got it's safe in the sense that there's lots of principles to guide you. And the way you make sure the things work is you use simulation. Uh, to make it work. So from this, what we get uh, are more complicated GLMs, things that I call monsters for dealing with uh, order categories and ranks, which are outcomes which look like counts, but are not counts. They're discrete, uh, they're ordered, uh, and the gaps between them are totally unknown. It's not like integers. In a count, the distance between 1 and 2 and 2 and 3 is the same. It's always 1. In uh, unordered categories, like a Likert scale, it's not like that at all, and this makes them a bit monstrous, but we can handle it. Um, and I think I'll spend all of Friday uh, just working on ordered categories. Um, uh, other kinds of things are mixtures. This is what the chapter starts with, and there are different kinds of mixtures uh, uh, with varying means and probabilities and rates, like the beta binomial and uh, negative binomial models that I mentioned uh, just a few slides back. Um, and that's the start of this chapter. I, I want to spend time in lecture talking about zero inflation and hurdle models. This is a really common issue where you've got a count, and it's a good count, but it arises from more than one process. And so there are lots of ways, for example, you can get a zero in science. Since you're all scientists, you're already imagining <laughs> ways that this can happen. Uh, this is this pollution effect where there are different ways to get zero. So the simplest would be your detection uh, is just not good enough. And so when counts are low, you record a zero. Uh, that's not a true zero, but you record it as a zero. That's zero inflation. Um, and I'm going to give you an example. Um, OK. The example I use in the book is uh, a simulation example, so you can see how the processes mix. Uh, so we're going to generate fake data here in this example. Um, and I, I do it in the context of thinking about uh, a monastery mystery and uh, in the history of this course actually this came from a case that one year I taught this at, at the University of California Davis there was somebody uh, in the class who studied monasteries <laughs> and uh, we would chat about data problems with monasteries after class and that's where this idea came from so it's a little bit silly but there's a real inferential problem to be figured out here now what I want you to imagine is that you're um, some sort of medieval investor, entrepreneur, and you go around buying up monasteries. Why might you want to do that? Because monasteries, they, they, they bring in money. Uh, they copy manuscripts and they produce wine. And both of these things produce income. And so it's worth owning monasteries. Yeah. Also, the labor is kind of free. right? You just pay them in wine. And uh, parchment. Wine and parchment. That's maybe, some, uh, maybe a pea garden. right? <laughs> and uh, so your uh, issue when you're trying to evaluate the economic value of any particular monastery is its output rate. And uh, what is the working capacity? How many manuscripts can they make uh, per day? Um, and the problem with just looking at the average rate per day is it comes from multiple processes. Right? You want to have a causal inference here. So uh, monks copy manuscripts and they can, they can finish a certain number in a given day, but they also drink. Right? This is the thing about the Christian tradition is that it's compatible with alcoholism. And uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm of Scottish descent, so yeah, definitely, right? The Presbyterian tradition. But uh, uh, the data we're interested in is the number of manuscripts completed on a given day, but we want to infer the number of days they get drunk. We're trying to identify the drunk uh, monasteries. And 
how would you analyze this? So let's build up the problem scientifically again to get us to a generalized linear model. Um, this is something that's going to be called a zero inflated uh, Poisson observation. There's a hidden state that we can't observe. In principle, we could, right? We could set up listening devices and, and cameras, closed captioning in the monastery, but the technology did not exist back then, right? And uh, you want to hang out in Prague and not visit your monastery, so you're just getting the data. And um, so you can't see this hidden state. You don't know if on any particular day whether they're drunk or sober. And you've got, uh, you observe a zero. Now the question is, were they drinking that day? Well, they could have been, but they could have just been working slow. Maybe they all, they finished a bunch of manuscripts the previous day, and they started a bunch on that day, and they didn't finish any. But they were working really hard. You'd observe a zero both ways. So if you observe a non-zero, they weren't all drunk. Maybe only some of them were. Uh, but if you observe a zero, you can't tell what happened. The hidden state is hidden from you. Uh, but what I want to show you is, even though you can't necessarily say on any particular day whether they were working or drinking, you can say on average how many days they drink if you've got enough data. And that's, what I, that's what zero inflated models do. You get information about the two mixed processes, even though you can't see the hidden state. This is a super important problem. Most of you don't have uh, monastery uh, uh, data, but you do study problems where zeros arise from more than one process. This happens all the time. Any kind of detection problem will be like this. You walk, sorry, I, I used to work with a lot of ecologists, so you walk transects through the woods and you count birds. Uh, you get zero that day. Does that mean there were no birds? <laughs> no, it means you're very distracted, right? Or visibility wasn't good. Any number of reasons you could get false zeros. False zeros are incredibly common in observational studies. Uh, in laboratory studies, um, it's usually not called inflation, but it's, uh, you get a hurdle model is what it's called, um, or zero augmentation. Anytime your chemical assay has a minimum sensitivity before it'll say anything is there, this is, those of you who work at benches, you know what I'm talking about, yeah? Uh, then you'll get false zeros. Uh, and this is called zero augmentation. Above a certain uh, concentration, you measure the concentration quite accurately. Below that, everything shows up as a zero. Uh, this is zero augmentation, and it's very similar. The models work very similar to this. So we can do this. Let me, let me uh, uh, build up this flow diagram on the right. Um, at the top of this, nature begins. Uh, there are two processes that could happen. P of the time, the monks decide to drink. It's like they've got a coin, a bias coin, and they flip it every morning, right, in the breakfast hall. <laughs> and, you know, and comes up steins and they drink. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, one minus p at the time they work. So if they drink, then you observe a zero. Uh, but if they work, you can also observe a zero. There's another way to get a zero, um, and the or are, are greater than zero. So if we simulate counts from this process, you get data that looks like this um, this histogram on the left. And the black ones is a pure Poisson process. That's what a Poisson distribution with a mean of, I think, one. Yeah, with a mean of one looks like. And the extra blue bit on the zeros, well, those are the drunk days. So you get zero, you get extra zeros. This is where the zero inflation terminology comes from. Does this make sense? So these are your extra zeros when you're walking transects in the woods or when you're doing chemical assays or whatever it is you're doing. You get some inflation of zeros. And so the, the aggregated data is not Poisson distributed. It's a mixture of a Poisson distribution and something else. In this case, it's a Bernoulli distribution, but it's a mixture of, of a Poisson and something else. Does this make sense? This happens a lot. This is an incredibly practical uh, type of model. So let me walk you through this graph again, uh, the process graph again, to help you understand how we write down the likelihood. We need a function for the probability of any given observation, whether it's a zero or a non-zero, right, the number of manuscripts finished. Uh, you make these models move, every Bayesian model moves by counting the number of ways you could observe that thing uh, conditional on your assumptions. So we need to get that now. So we're going to walk through the garden again. At the beginning, we've got this binomial process, Bernoulli process, P of the time, they're going to drink. One minus P of the time, they're going to work. Uh, say you observe a zero. Uh, there are two ways you could do that. One is going down the p path there, and the other is going down the 1 minus p, and then exponent minus, minus lambda is just the Poisson probability of getting a zero. It's a really simple, uh, nice likelihood function, the Poisson. It's super simple. Um, so we need both of those terms, and then there are alternatives 
And you may remember when you study probability theory, that if, if there are two ways for something to happen, then you add them together, right? Because it's, it's an or. Every time you say the English word or, you need an addition in your probability expression. So either p or 1 minus p exponent minus lambda. And that's your probability of a 0. Does that make sense? And um, the other thing that can happen is you observe n, and there's only one way for that to happen. So let me try to summarize for you. I want to say there's only one way for that to happen, in which case you just go down that path on the right. 1 minus p times the Poisson probability of the value greater than 0, which is that thing. That's the Poisson likelihood that you're looking at there. You don't have to memorize that. Your computer already knows it, uh, but that's all it is. So let me try to summarize. Two ways, so we want the probability of a zero. It comes from, you, you, you make a, a graph like this. Uh, this is a DAG, by the way. It's a directed acyclic graph. Uh, they're back. <laughs> uh, it's used for a different thing. This is not a causal DAG, right? This is a, this is a statistical DAG. But um, uh, we can go P or one minus P exponent minus lambda. That's the probability of a zero, conditional on P and lambda. Yeah? I know you're drawing the owl now. Uh, you'll sit down and get this later. And, uh, but this general strategy works for anything, no matter how complicated the model is. If you can write down the DAG process for it, you can get the likelihood out of it. And then the other path going down the right, 1 minus p times the Poisson probability. So it's just 1 minus p times the Poisson. That's all it is. Right. Why is the 1 minus p there? Because you had to work to observe something greater than 0. The only time you'll observe a count greater than 0 is when they were working. That's what the model assumes. Right. Good? Exciting? Yeah. Um, so that's all the hard work. Usually when you run these models, you never see all that stuff because there are these little helper functions uh, like z Poisson, <laughs> uh, zi Poisson, um, for zi for zero inflated, which is bundle all that together. They take those two probability expressions and an if-then statement, and they just use them to construct, to return the right probability for any observation. And then, now here's the trick that is going to look a little funny. Uh, we've got two parameters. We've got a P, which is the probability they drink or work, right? That's the probability of, of which process you select. And you can make that a linear model of anything you like, a generalized linear model of anything you like. You can have predictor variables that predict which, whether they drink or not, that are different from predictor variables that give you the rate at which they work. They could be completely different. For example, uh, the weather may determine whether they drink or not, but the weather may have no effect on how rapidly they work. Yeah, it depends upon the scientific process, but there's, these are just up to your scientific uh, uh, situation. They should be bespoke. Remember this annoying word that no one but me uses? <laughs> yeah, bespoke. Uh, they should be bespoke to your application. These linear models are different models. They have their own parameters. They have their own predictors. Whatever you think is, is needed, <coughs> Uh, to make the right kind of model. Um, but uh, you need link functions on them, and uh, lambda is like a Poisson regression. Uh, P is like a logistic regression. And you already know how to work with both of those. Does this make some sense? So this is why I said these things are like monsters, right? These little bits. So we have taken the cat and the dog and stuck them together <laughs> to make the cat dog, and it's terrifying. Uh, but it's also really powerful. And a model like this can do a lot of really good things because natural processes have these fix features. Natural observable processes are mixtures of component processes, so we need models like this. Um, in the book, uh, we simulate the data, so I'm going to walk you through that now uh, to help you understand what's going on. This is a when I'm developing um, bespoke, uh, is that word again? Uh, statistical applications. I always do this. I want to know that my code works. I want to uh, help, my, help develop intuitions for myself about how the model behaves. So I simulate data from a known process, and then I feed it into my statistical model. I make sure the thing functions. And um, so uh, uh, we can do this, uh, uh, this so-called dummy data process quite easily in R. I've already showed you several examples. The goal is to recover estimates and understand the model, um, and also kind of test the limits of what, what the model can do. There are going to be combinations of parameters where the model doesn't do very well because that's how nature is. Uh, here's the whole simulation. It's really easy. And I'd like to walk through this code. I don't do a lot of that in this course. I like to walk through it so you see how dead easy it is to do this kind of simulation. This is 
the same statistical model, but this is going forward. So remember, at some point at the beginning of the course, I asserted that for a Bayesian model, all Bayesian models are generative. What that means is you can run them in either direction. If you don't have data, you plug parameters into them and they produce data. That's the direction we're going to go on this slide. If you do have data and you don't have parameters, you run them in the opposite direction and then they spit out not parameters but distributions of parameters because it's not sure what the true parameter values are. So it just rates them, their relative plausibilities. Does that make sense? But you can always run the model both directions. And this is a huge aid. There are lots of statistical models in other frameworks which are not generative and you cannot run them both, both directions. That doesn't mean they're bad models. It just means they're hard to understand. Uh, yeah, they don't make predictions in that case. Okay, so first line here, uh, we define some parameters. We pick, we're playing God. The probability that monks drink on any given day is 20%. That's pretty industrious in the Middle Ages, probably. Uh, <laughs> when they do work, they finish on average one manuscript a day. You know, these are, these are beautiful illuminated manuscripts, right? Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about, these great things. With the Lindisfarne Gospels and things like that. Um, we're going to have a whole year sample now. You're deciding whether you're going to invest in this monastery. Uh, so we're going to have 365 days of production. And then we just simulate. Um, I set a seed so you can replicate this. There's nothing special about the number inside set seed. This just means that all the random number functions that come after it will produce the same results when you use the same seed. It sets the machine state, right? And uh, then we simulate um, a binomial thing first, whether they drink or not. This is the drink indicator variable. Yeah, 365 drink or dr not drink decisions. Yeah. And then we simulate the manuscripts. And this is conditional on the drinking. Uh, it, here, y is 1 minus drink. Remember, drink is a 0 on indicator. So if drink is 1, y is always 0. Make sense? Uh, if drink is 0, meaning they worked, then it's just a random Poisson number, which could be 0, right? because Poisson distributions do produce zeros. And in this case, the mean is one, so it'll produce a lot of zeros, actually. You'll get a lot of zeros just naturally from the, you know, how long it takes to make an illuminated manuscript. Okay, does this make sense? Is this helpful? I, when I was learning statistics, I thought exercises like this were the only reason I ever understood anything, is running the model forward. Um, otherwise, it's just some black box machine which spits out probability distributions, right? Um, okay, so here's the code, the Ulam code to do this. Let's repeat the mathematical version of the model at top. Um, I've written this DZI POS helper function. Uh, when Ulam sees that, it's going to interpret that to mean you want to do this multiple choice thing where you ask if it's a zero or not, and then you have that P plus uh, one minus P E to the minus lambda, and if it's greater than zero, then you use one minus P times the Poisson probability of that count. Uh, it just does that internally, but that's all it does. And then the rest is a standard model. All the other features you're used to, um, no predictors in this, but uh, uh, AP and AL, the intercepts of the two processes are different parameters, right? Because there's, there's an average rate you need to estimate and there's an average rate of drinking you need to estimate. Does this make sense? Yeah. And um, just show you at the bottom, the machine works, right? You knew it was gonna work, otherwise I wouldn't be showing the example, but <laughs> there's a selection effect. But no, this is, a, uh, uh, this is the way you verify the machinery's working. Uh, the posterior mean uh, rate of drinking that you estimate is a little over 20%, right? And uh, uh, the, the rate of completion, the rate of production on any given day they do work is right around one. Something to note is your simulations are finite. So you shouldn't be surprised that you don't recover exactly the data generating parameters because the sample doesn't represent them exactly. So if your machine works correctly, it won't get exactly right true data generating parameter values. Does that make sense? But you should cover them with high probability if the machine is doing right and the sample is of any reasonable size. So you should not be surprised uh, that it is not exactly 0.2 because the sample hasn't, just because of the stochasticity, they drank more than 0.2 of the days in the year just because of the stochasticity. And that's why the posterior distribution says it's more like 0.21 because that's what it was actually in the sample. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, Okay, there's an overthinking box in this section, at the end of this section, where uh, I talk about how you could code this without the helper function. Um, and I think 
if you're interested in understanding these kinds of mixtures, and mixture models are really useful, this is a good box to attend to. This is the same ULA model. It'll give you exactly the same posterior as the previous one, the one with the DZI POS in it. All DZI POS does, when ULAM sees that, it replaces it with the two lines at the top here. Again, there's this Y pipe, Y greater than zero means Y, conditional on Y being greater than zero is distributed as this thing. And then there's this arbitrary stand code in there. And I know it looks weird, but there's a box that explains why we do things this way. We do everything on the log scale in statistics because otherwise things explode. Uh, and what that means is explained in the box. Now, it's perfectly fine though to use DZI plus. I do, <laughs> that's why I wrote it. But uh, uh, it's good to have some understanding about what's going on. And if you ever tried to do this on your own, you are licensed, uh, you are a licensed professional now. You can draw the owl. Yes, you can. <laughs> and, uh, okay, um, there's no reason you can't also do uh, zero inflated things other ways, like zero inflated binomial would look very similar. Uh, there's this Bernoulli process that generates excess zeros, and then there's a binomial count. You replace the Poisson with a binomial, and the model stays basically the same. And you could write that mixture using the custom code, if you like. I have not yet written a DZI binome uh, for ULA, but I could do that, I guess. Uh, but you could just do it with the custom code, too. There are also things called hurdle models. I mentioned these. These um, uh, are much more common with continuous distributions, uh, con uh, where you've got some, like I said, some chemical assay, and it'll be some number greater than zero, but there's an excess of zeros because there's some thresholding effect where you can't detect anything. And you get lots of this in, in bench work uh, all the time. And um, so uh, another case where this shows up for the anthropologists in the audience is um, in human production data. Uh, this happens all the time because say, say you're a human forager, something my department studies a lot. You go and you spend eight hours in the forest and you come back with nothing. That happens most of the time. Hunting's hard, right? The animals don't want to be eaten, surprisingly. And they're not like goats and sheep, right? It's just like beg to be eaten almost, right? No, <laughs> they don't, but uh, it's, they're not hard to catch. Uh, if, you're, if you're hunting a howler monkey, uh, some of the data that, that my department analyzes, uh, it's much harder uh, to catch them, and half of trips will be zeros. And then uh, when you do manage to get one, what's recorded is the kilograms of meat you bring back. So if, you're, if you want a statistical model for the kilograms of meat produced per hour of foraging, it's massively zero augmented, massively. Uh, it's, it's not that there's some threshold effect, it's that hunting's hard. And 50 to 60 to 70% of all trips can be zeros. And, but when you do get something, it's way more than you're gonna eat in a day. And that's why human societies exist, <laughs> right? It's because of that basic uh, economic reality that we balance the risk uh, against the high mean return uh, of hunting. So, um, but there are lots of cases where you get mixtures of processes, right? In order to have some kilograms of meat to eat, uh, two things have to happen. You have to catch something, and then you need to figure out how big it was, <laughs> right? And both of those, there are two distributions that mix together to produce then uh, the observation that comes out. Um, yeah, oh, last thing I wanna say at the bottom. Multi-level models are also a mixture, uh, uh, and a, a very flexible type of mixture, and we'll spend, like I said, probably two whole weeks on multi-level models at the end of the course. Okay, um, when you come back uh, on Friday, we're gonna spend all day Friday on one of my favorite kinds of outcome distributions. It's incredibly common, at least in psychology, yeah, uh, also in anthropology, called the ordered category. So we're just gonna stop right here, and uh, when you come back, uh, I will have a well-worked out large data set example for ordered categories on both sides of the regression, meaning as an outcome, and as a predictor. And both cases require special treatment, uh, and it's incredibly useful for sort of basic regression tasks in the behavioral sciences. Okay, thank you for your indulgence. I'll see you on Friday.